the ggplot2 with our book club for the data science learning community. My name is Colin Berkey, and today I'm actually going to be talking about chapter five. So I think we still have some issues with the chaptering um, that might need to be fixed. But today I'm going to talk about statistical summaries. Um, I will say that this was a stretch chapter for me. Uh, I will say that I had to kind of brush off some statistics 101 um, in this. So if I do misrepresent something, please, you know, anybody in the group, please jump in and help me out. Um, it's been a while since I've been out of academia and done some statistics stuff. So um, definitely tell me if I get something wrong. So today, what we really want to cover is we want to make sure that um, we understand how to use ggplot to plot possible uncertainty in our data. And then also have some tools in our toolbox to determine which geometric objects best presents your type of data is what we kind of want to get out of this. I do have to say that I am using the notes from the previous cohort or two cohorts, two cohorts before. So some of these notes are not necessarily mine, but they were added from the previous cohort. And a lot of the examples that are here are from the book. So we'll cover them. And so I think most of it is um, we can talk about those specific examples or questions that we have, because I have a few uh, questions that I had when I was reading the chapter. So before we get started, does anybody want to add um, where we're kind of going today? Okay, great. So to start off, I think we need to start with some definitions in this chapter. Um, really, this is going back to basic data understanding. Uh, something that I've kind of taken from the book as we've been going through this when it comes to plotting is just understanding the structure of your data. Asking yourself, what type of data do I have? And this is especially important when it comes to statistical summaries because the structure of your data or the type of data that you have is going to dictate what you can actually do with it. Um, especially when it comes to using statistical summaries that are available in ggplot2. So Going way, way back to our Statistics 101, here's some different things. Discrete value, continuous value. Uh, discrete being some finite number, right? It has something that's countable, has a beginning and end. And then a continuous value would be something like an infinite number, something that never ends. And there is no stop point in between values. Also, this was added from the previous cohort. I'm not sure this is why this is here, but they said grobs, which is just a graphical object. And then we'll also talk about overplotting, which is too much data on a scatter plot, or I'm going to go even further and say that it's too much data on any plot that makes the underlying relationships obscure, which there are certain strategies that ggplot provides that allows you to address this issue of overplotting or to um, fix it. So, so now that we have a foundation to work from, let's go on and discuss some revealing uncertainty was kind of the first section. Um, when you have information about uncertainty in your data, you'll want to display it, right? You'll want to display it. So if you have some form of standard error that you've calculated from the values that you've created or that you have within your data, you want to represent that in some way if you have that information. One thing, and this is getting a little bit out of my depth, is there are many ways to calculate standard error. So um, I am not a statistician, so I can't go over all of those different ways to calculate them, but the book basically says like, listen, there's many ways to do this. And just so you know, um, it's up to you to calculate it. However, there are some summary functions that can help you, or ggplot has some summary functions to help in those simple cases, right? And some of those primary types of geometric objects that are available to you, again, depending on the data that you have, if you have discrete X, you're gonna be using things like geom, error bar, geom line range. If you have discrete X and you're looking at representing both the range and the center, you're looking at using geom crossbar or geom point range. Uh, if you have a continuous X, you're going to use, and you're specifically looking to plot out the range of those values, geom ribbon. If you have a continuous X and you're looking at representing both range and center, you're going to use geom, uh, geom smooth stat equals identity. And so the book provides some of these examples with an example data set where we have this value Y and then we have a value X. And from that, there's a standard error that just gets manually inputted. It's not calculated in any way. And what it does is just goes through and talks about, OK, if you want to do these things where you're representing the range, range and center, range and range and center for a specific discrete or continuous variable, these are what you're going to use. 
I'm just going to go through these quickly because I think we can all visually see what they're doing. But here's crossbar. It's just going to give those values. It's going to give a range and then a crossbar for uh, it's going to give a range based on the standard error uh, using Y min and Y max. And then geom point range is just going to change the geometric shape what we're using. Obviously, we get a dot for the center and then we get a line for the range. Geom smooth is a little different. It's going to create an actual line for us. And then the standard R is going to be represented by some type of um, like rectangle around that specific line. Okay. Error bar, same thing. We're just going to get a different representation of it, but this is going to be more for your continuous X, if I'm right. Error bar. Nope. Discrete. Excuse me. Discrete. You're going to get something like this. Geom lane, lane, line range. Just going to show the range and then geom ribbon. Same thing right here. And so it goes back to that concept. If you're trying to um, trying to represent um, trying to represent I'm trying to say this correctly. If you're trying to represent some type of uncertainty within your calculations that you're plotting or the data that you have, um, it's going to depend on the data types that you have and what type of geom you want to use to correctly represent it. Uh, like I said, I had to brush off some rustiness from my stats 101. So if someone can further explain that in better clarity, please do. And I see Kaya has a question. So Kaya, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was just a little confused reading this. Like actually several of the geoms that are mentioned here, I didn't know about um, like geom line range. And um, I have always used geom error bar combined with geom point. Um, but what's the one? Uh, yeah, point range. So what is the difference or is there a difference between geom point range versus geom point plus geom error bar? Um, like do you have, is it just a shortcut in the same way that like geom call is a shortcut for geom bar? That is a great question. I'm going to open it up to the group because I am unsure. Yeah. Does anybody in the group have any answers to that? I think that the only difference is that, for example, so they're all going to calculate, um, so let's say a point, but because you can have this also on top of a bar. So I think that the difference is just how mm -hmm. they look. You I need a, a, a high value and a low value, right? Like a, like a mean and a max. Mm -hmm. That can be a mean and a max. That can be your um, confidence intervals, your credible intervals. So I think this is this is anything that has a, ma um, a mean and max value, right? But yeah. the only thing that's going to change is the way it looks. So with point range is you have a point and then a line. Right. But the other, the error bar looks kind of like a box plot in the sense that it has like a little roof and a little like uh, floor, if you will. So I think I think that's only the only difference between all of them. Yeah, I always um, get rid of when it them. comes to this, like yeah. I always just do geom point and then I do geom error bar width equals zero, which gets rid of the um, tails because I don't like how those look and I've heard that it's misleading because it draws too much attention to the extremities. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like it might just be multiple ways to accomplish the exact same thing. Exactly, I think that's the point because a geom is only the way something is visualized, right? So the geom is saying that it's going to be a box, it's going to be a triangle, it's going to be what, right? So in this case, stop using error bar if you don't like how they look with the little yeah. ceiling and the floor and just use geom uh, point range or lines. Yeah. Because the line, I think, it doesn't have the point in the middle. It's just going to be a line. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it just depends on your aesthetics, I think. Line range, for example, is something that I have I've never used. I use the other two, either the error bar or the um, or just the lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I agree. Those things, especially when they have like a very um, wide top and bottom things, yeah, that looks that looks horrendous. <laughs> I make mine always like shorter, but I I make sure that I put them in. But yeah, I, I think it depends on your preference. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it kind of goes back to, and this is talked about a little bit later too, it depends on the specific audience that you're writing to, I think. Um, I know I'm speaking to some people that are still working in academia here. Um, I know uncertainty is important for my minimal statistical background to represent, but for the audience that I write to, I don't necessarily know if people would really understand. I think they, they're capable of understanding, but they wouldn't understand the importance 
of why these should be represented. So I don't really, <laughs> I really don't use these very often to the audience that I write to, but um, excellent, great points. Uh, I also do have to say, because this is the previous cohort, I tried to simplify it because I know we're trying to do one slide per concept, but um, the previous cohort that put this together, it, it was kind of kind of blocky. So it's uh, I'll try and fix this a little bit more, but um, it's kind of hard with the examples that we have. So let's talk a little Actually, bit about, uh, go ahead, go ahead. That's Abby. a good point because uh, we had this discussion with um, with John several times. And I always, um, I'm a perfectionist, so for me, it was like, John, I'm sorry, they're not perfect, but this is what I have. And he's like, it doesn't have to be perfect. The thing is, mm -hmm. just improve it a little bit more so that the your slides look better than the previous one, right? Like the previous cohort. And then the next cohort is going to improve your data a little bit more or your slides a little bit more. So then it's like a work in progress kind of thing. He's not expecting things to be perfect. The thing that we have talked about, but I can ask him on Slack, is that we're trying to get rid of the numbers, like the 4.1, 4.2, 4.3. And you can do that by putting the um, curly brackets next to the title. So weighted data, space, curly brackets, and then a minus in the middle. That will get rid of that. And it's not necessarily a section per page. It's more like a, think of this as a PowerPoint. This is a slide deck. So it's like what you show me here and then Show me other things in the next slide so that there's minimum scrolling up and down. But that's that's the things that he has said in previous um, cohorts that have been him, with him and hooked up. So just, so just so you know. So don't even worry about this being perfect or not calling. This is great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I can't take uh, I can't, can't, can't take credit because I really appreciate Ryan Metcalf because I checked to put these in. <laughs> he put these together, so it helped me a lot because I was... This is a pretty meaty chapter, but yeah, definitely. Whoever, if if the next cohort's watching this, a great way to improve these these chapter is try and make one slide per concept that you want to discuss. So, um, moving on with weighted data. So, if each row of your data frame contains multiple observations, we can use a weight to visually give scale to observations. Um, we need to consider also that this is really important that our choice of a weighting variable has effects on the plot and what we're trying to represent with the plot and the conclusions that we're trying to get across to the people that are consuming this plot. Um, with simple geomes, they're just going to use the uh, size aesthetic um, for our weighting. So an example here would be with geome point. Um, we're looking at this data set called Midwest. It provides demographic information and community information um, about Midwest counties. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of what the variables are. Here we're looking at percent below poverty um, in comparison to percent um, white uh, individuals. And here it has no weighting, right? It's a pretty simple scatter plot, but it really doesn't highlight the unique relationships in regards to population size, right? There's different population sizes across different counties or different areas in the Midwest, okay? So what we can do is we can weight it, and one way we can weight it is in the aesthetic within our points, within Geome Point, is we can do it by population in millions, right? And so here's just shorthand to do a million. So what we can do is just a division of the population total divided by million and change the size of the bubble. And because of this, we're starting to see different relationships that are occurring between percent white and percent below poverty in relation to the population within millions. And so obviously, I mean, we could dig into this a little bit more if we want to, but obviously there are some counties, there are some counties that have a very small population, but have a very high poverty rate and are necessarily more diverse. But there are some population centers that are larger, that are more diverse and have less um, poverty. But we wouldn't have seen this relationship if we didn't weight it. So ggplot provides us the opportunity, very simply, to use the size aesthetic to weight it um, this way. If we want to get more complicated and do some type of statistical transformation with this, we sure can. Um, what we're going to use is we're going to use the weight aesthetic, and we're going to use the weight aesthetic um, I think it's specifically in the actual geome itself. It is. Yep. So here, if we wanted to look at the linear relationship between percent white and percent below poverty, we sure can do this. Uh, here we can do it on weighted. Um, we can see that relationship here. But 
what we can do is we can add that weighting both in the size of uh, the genome point, but then also within our linear um, model that we're creating or the trend line that we're creating. And then what we're doing is we're just adding that into the weight aesthetic in the genome smooth. And what you'll notice is that this relationship isn't as um, negative as um, this one here, right? And that's just because we applied a statistical transformation using weighting within the actual creation of the model geome using geome smooth. I said a lot there. Um, I'm not totally convinced that I said that correctly. So if anybody wants to jump in and um, add more detail, please do. That's fascinating. I had no idea that this was a thing we could do. Um, what I'm trying to get my head around is what would be the equivalent, like let's say you weren't in ggplot and you were just making a linear model with this data. Like I haven't used a linear model with weighting before. I don't know if I'm just missing something. Like what would that look like in a model formula? Would it just be equ the equivalent of having that many points at that location or, or what would it be statistically? Have you ever used an offset in a model? Because that's exactly what it does. I don't it's think truly, so. I've, I've seen it. I've, I, I am actually, I just used one. When you do like a logarithmic model, like a, instead of uh -huh. a linear model, and then you use the offset term. I'll see if I can find some information on that. But that offset is actually weighing it. Like for example, let's say that you have deer detections in camera traps or however yeah. you want. And then, but you didn't sample the same number of days across all your stations. Let's say some of them you had just two weeks, but yeah. all some of them were like two months. So then you put this offset to actually say, yeah, I have all of these detections, but these were just 14 days and these other detections, but these were 30 days. So that offset sort of like takes that into account that weight. So that's the only way that I've seen it done. I'm sure maybe there are other ways. Okay, cool. That's the one I need. But yeah, I think you explained it well, Colin. I think I think it makes sense. Like you just put the weight in the GM smooth and you put the variable that you want to use as the as a weight, right? Like we're weighing it by the population size. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, you know, in my day to day, <laughs> in my day-to-day, -to -day, if I go beyond just a, a simple linear model, um, yeah, I don't go beyond that in my, in my work, but definitely in other, in other contexts, I could see this being more work. But I do, I do see the importance of population weighting, especially where I'm at and the kind of work I do. So I could see myself applying some of these things. Um, so we could do the same thing with genome histogram. Um, same thing if we want to create a histogram with some type of population weighting, same thing. We're just going to use the geome histogram here. Um, we're going to do a bin width of one. But again, if we want, we just use the weight to put the population total into the aesthetic. And then that's what we're getting is we're just going to just modify it. But then what's going to do is it's going to, instead of being a count of counties with it, it's actually going to be based on population. So here, what we're doing, the weight is actually changing the Y access representation. So now you're getting a distribution of percent below poverty based on the population in thousands rather than the number of counties. So I think one thing that is unclear within this and what I, when I first came to this chapter, and this is probably going to be my feedback that I'm going to add, is creating a better understanding of what statistical transformations are happening in the background. And if there's a way to clarify that because in my mind, it's like, okay, you're just plugging these in, you're getting that one-to-one -one representation of what's in your data going to your plot. But then, like, it's that black box of, okay, if I do this, what statistical transformation is actually happening? And I thought that's what this chapter was going to cover, and it did a little bit, but it took a little bit for that click to actually happen to be like, oh, if you change your aesthetic in these ways, it's going to change the transformation that it's going to do or the representation of the statistical transformation it's going to do. Does that make sense? For anybody, did anybody else have that same thought going through this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I yeah, think, I think, be I think it's... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Gabby. Because, for example, here, that's one of the things that I... It's usually why I don't like to do it inside ggplot, because you don't really have the numbers. You only have the graph. And sometimes that's good because 
you just want something fast. So what I how I usually work is I have my table and it already has my, you know, the transformation that I wanted to use, even if it's log, just a small log or something like that. I rather have my data where I know what I did to the numbers. And then I just put that into ggplot. When you do it like this, I agree with you, Colin, you really don't know what you're doing. It's a black box because that way, what is it doing to my data? We really don't know. Because here, for example, if you don't, you're setting the Y axis title too. So you're saying population 1000s, but you could have just said they're dinosaur and nobody would know, All right? This is not populating the Y axis title. So yeah, I agree with you. That's a good comment to add to the discussion. Yeah, just to, just to elucidate, like what's the black box, what's happening? Maybe a simple diagram or something just, cause that's the one thing that I get is just like, hey, you're plugging these values in but I have no idea what happens when you plug them in, in the back end. So, and maybe that's just a limitation of the package and it's just, it is what it is. So um, uh, I think we can kind of skip through these real quick, but it's kind of doing the same thing just for the sake of time, but it's just manipulating um, the genome histogram and what's going on with it. Again, you can change it. You can modify it here again with the weights and you can divide it within like, thousands, millions, but I think we can kind of skip from there. Um, displaying distributions, just really quickly, these examples are going to use the diamonds dement or the diamonds data set. We referenced this the last time I gave a presentation. It's just an example of different dimensions of diamonds. Um, the book has a really good graphic of what the actual measurements are. Um, I'm not in the diamond trade and I don't deal in diamonds. Um, so I guess if you need to know more about it, here it is. Um, so let's talk a little bit about displaying distributions. Uh, the Diamond data set's great for this because it's a, it's a, it's a big data set. It has 54,000 rows and it gives us the opportunity to change some aspects of our genome to kind of see uh, how to change how the actual plot looks based on those different genome settings that we have. So let's just make a basic histogram here. We're gonna look at the depth of a diamond um, and then get the just basic kind of histogram of it here again. We're getting the count of diamonds and then we're getting the distribution based on the depth. So the number, so the number of diamonds with a specific depth and we're kind of seeing the distribution of it. So the book suggests and in the notes here, it suggests that you probably don't want to use the stock histogram. You want to take an opportunity to change the bin width or change the X limits to kind of zoom into the distribution. I think of that, I, my perspective is, you know, obviously think about your audience and make sure you're representing your data in a valid way. So know that if you do change these, you are changing the representation of your data, but obviously don't manipulate it to a point just to cherry pick conclusions. Um, but the book and the notes here previously suggest that you're probably gonna change these, right? So, and that's what I'm just saying right here. Um, but if you want to be, and this is something that I took away from it too, is if you are going to modify the bin width in any way, you probably should create some type of caption down here. And I guess that's another criticism of the book. It says to do this, but it doesn't show you how to do it. <laughs> so I think the book should probably, if it's making the suggestion of providing a caption of some type, it probably should give an example of what that looks like. But I took this away of being like, yeah, if I'm going to modify this plot, provide some information about, okay, what does this represent? Represent. So there's also different ways to compare distributions. Um, we can create small multiples using facet wrap. I think this is great. I've used facet wrap to do this. Um, I've used facet wrap quite a bit to create small multiples or multiple um, plots based on a specific variable, specifically like a categorical variable. Um, we can use frequency policy or frequent poly, and then we can also use density plot. And I'm going to ask somebody to explain density plot to me because um, that one I'm not 100% sure about. And I'll be honest, it's one of those that I've kind of come across in the past. And it's been like, I don't know if anybody's ever seen that like Park and Rex meme with um, where is it? We're like, everybody's using these, but nobody's ever talked about it. I don't know if I ever, ever remembers that meme. It's kind of like that. Like I see people use geom, use the density plot. And I've never really asked the question of like, Hey, somebody explain this to me. So hopefully I can get a group of people to explain that to me. I but, think the um, density, 
Go ahead. Yeah, the go ahead. GM density is doing a kernel distribution. It's doing a kernel smoothing situation, I think. But let me read about that. But I think it's doing a kernel. So that's why it's it smooths out the... And I think you can set a parameter there to estimate how many, like, what's going to be the smoothing parameter of the kernel. Um, so, yeah, let me read about that and I'll, and I'll see about that. But, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, and it's a true yeah. density function, so the area under the curve will always be one. Um, mm -hmm. So you can directly compare. I'm not sure if GeoMFreak Poly is a density function. I think maybe it's not. No. Free poly is like, um, I think it's, I think frequency polygons are just basically a histogram with smoothing in between the the bar, the um, the bins. And then the density plot is essentially scaling all of your, all of your distributions as if they had That's the same. That's the kernel. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, a big issue with, you know, for example, my data collecting stuff from museum specimens, it's very opportunistic or uh, using Gabby's example of like camera trap, like you might want to know like what the density or, you know, you, you might want to compare like frequencies of, I don't know, deer in different habitats and like depending on how close they are to like an urban center or whatever. Um, but you might have like twice as many deer in like a rural setting versus like a more urban setting. Um, so using the density plot will actually sort of pretend that you're looking at the same sample size. Whereas if you're doing like a histogram or a frequency polygon, because it uses a count, it will exaggerate the differences the more, the larger your sample is basically. That is a that that actually clarified that up quite a bit for me. Um, I guess the takeaway. Let me summarize to make sure this is correctly. So, basically, with the density, it's putting everything kind of on the same level, so you can make comparisons, or it's less deceiving for you to make those comparisons. But then, when it comes to something like frequent poly, it doesn't have that transformation, so it's hard to it's more challenging to see those differences. Am I on the right wavelength? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it can be more challenging. And, and with all of this stuff, it's going to depend on, you know, what you're interested in, because maybe you are interested to know that there are like, an, in absolute terms, there are way more of these like yellow line diamonds at a depth of like 61. Mm. Depth of 61. Oh, sorry. Millimeters? No, it's not 61 millimeters. That's too big. Um, I don't know what what the depth units are, but <laughs> um, I see, yeah, I see what you're saying. I want to know that, but if you only care, like, because because basically what I'm guessing is that there's just like more diamonds are produced at that like yellow. Uh, cut, which is like mm -hmm. probably like the most popular one for wedding rings or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But you might not, you might want to like, you're, you might be like, I don't care. We know that yellow is the most common, but like if you compare them as if they're all on a level playing field, that's when you would want to use the density plot, I think. Yeah. I haven't used density plots before, but that's kind of my. So the density is, the, is, is doing the kernel. You can yeah. control how smooth your, your, I'm trying to look for an animation, a beautiful animation. If I can find it, I will put it in the Slack thing. For now, let's just use this one that's on Twitter. But essentially the kernel, what it does is, so you have all your bars, right? So what it's gonna do, it's gonna say, if you put a weight of, it depends, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, the larger it is, then it, it kind of like it's aggregating three of your bins and putting them together. So that's one point. The other three, and that's another point. So then it's not like this, like a histogram, right? Like it looks like a, like a set of stairs or steps. Mm -hmm. It smooths it down. So think of like a cake when you have like, um, 
like one of those cakes that you so if you put very little weight it's gonna look your cake is gonna look like all the levels right with your cake it, mm -hmm. it has tears but if you smooth it out with a lot of weight then it it just looks like um you lose those tears right it just looks smoother yeah so that depends on there's that's a whole thing a kernel distribution we don't have a lot of time for that but the way you control the smoothing parameter is with weight inside the geom density so there if you put weight 0.1 then the smoothing is going to look one way and if you put weight equals 0.5 then it's going to be super smooth so it's essentially just like a little hill whereas less weight i think it is like that less weight it's still going to have a little a few ridges or something like that so it's just smoothing smoothing your histogram that's essentially what it's doing um, okay, so oh, yeah. right. sorry, Gabby. I didn't mean to cut. I didn't mean to jump over That's you. It. So I think the other thing that okay, and this is again, this is probably going to be my lack of statistical knowledge here, right? We do geom frequent policy or frequent poly, and it's giving a count, but then it it changes the what the y axis representation is. What is this? Like, this is the one question I have is like, okay, it changes the values or it changes the actual measurement of what density is. What is that calculation? What is that? Because that's the kernel distribution. Essentially, what you're doing is you are mm -hmm. estimating that density. So you, you are um, with your data, like I said, all those bins that you're combining, you're applying uh, like this formula of this kernel thing to your data. So then that's why you have now a density. The other one, but it says counts. I think the freak poly, freak, frequent poly, whatever that thing is called, freak poly sounds awful. But anyway, what I think what that's doing is like think about putting like a like a a point on top of your uh, histogram bar, and then you put a line from that point to the one previous to the previous one. So you just have a line. Instead of having a bar and another bar, you're just connecting those two things with a line. I think that's what the freak poly is doing. Whereas the density, like I said, you apply like like you apply this um, density kernel distribution to your data. Yeah, it, it, yeah, like it's not a transformation, but but it is a transformation. Does anybody know because it's 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 scaled for the. For the density plot, it's going to be scaled so that basically all your values are going to be between zero and one. Um, should I'm wondering, therefore, if no, never mind, because I think for each each per, each distribution, so each individual um, hill. <laughs> um, yeah. I think all of those values, if you added like at every point together, they would probably all add up to one, meaning like you're yes. 100% of your data. So it's basically you take like, oh, okay. your data, you go bullet and like spread it over the value. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, exactly. I see you. The, yeah, everything underneath the curve is one or 100%. Mm -hmm. and that's what all your data said. has to be there. Yeah. So yeah. all you're controlling is the weight. And you're right. If you apply a super high weight, essentially you have a straight line like that. Because it's covering all mm. your data, but it's all like, you know, it's kind of like a blanket. Yeah. 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 So that, that's okay. a good point, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So and that kind of goes back to what Kaya said. So that clears that up for me. Okay. <laughs> I think I think we spent enough time of of of, <laughs> of uh giving me some information on stuff that I probably should have learned a long time ago, but I do appreciate everybody clarifying that for me. Um, no, no, we're here to learn. Don't worry. Yeah, I think that was a really helpful, like, learning, learning, uh, group learning activity because I, it's not something I had ever really put that much thought into either. So I definitely understand mm -hmm. it. That's good. I'm glad we're in alignment with that. So awesome. Um, so Geo and Boxplot, I'm going to kind of go through this really quickly and highlight the one thing that I found interesting from this. Um, so I think we're all familiar with what a box plot is, so I don't have to cover it. Um, but one thing that I found interesting is, is that we could use cut with. So if we have a continuous variable, what we can do is we can put that into, we can wrap the variable around that, make it a discrete variable with cut with, and then it will split the boxes up or it will create box plots for every single 
like bin or cut width for each one of those. And then it will give us a representation of the distribution across those discrete values that were created basically. Uh, GM volume, our violin is just another representation of this data. We can talk about the pluses and minuses of both. It just provides uh, a clear view of the distribution without highlighting like outliers or the specific middle of the, or the specific um, measure of central tendency. Um, but it kind of has the same thing. You can use cut width, creates the bins for us, and then it just kind of changes that continuous variable into a um, discrete variable. It does talk a little bit about geom dot plot. Um, it doesn't mention talking more about the, uh, dot plots, but it mentions that you would will use this for um, if you have a not large data, but a smaller set of data. Um, the notes didn't have an example. I didn't come up with one, but um, those are basically the ones that it was covered. So I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but um, does anybody have any final thoughts before we move on to dealing with overplotting? Excellent. So overplotting. Um, so this gives an example through scatter plots. Sometimes we just have a lot of data and that data just overlaps and that's overplotting. And so there's different ways that we can tweak the aesthetics to, to change that. So one thing we could do is we can modify the shape. And I thought all of these were great examples. So we can modify the shape to either be hollow circles or pixel size. Um, so here's just the example data. Here's just some random data and we have just a scatter plot of it. We could do hollow circles. Um, I thought this was kind of nice. Um, I thought pixel size was really great because I've never really seen this used until I did some stuff with a specific analysis that I was doing. That pixel shape was really important. Um, I don't want to get too deep into it, but basically it was like a big matrix of data. And some of those, there's a lot of missing data in it. And it's just a lot of data with the matrix that it had. And it used pixels because there's just a lot of like little areas where missing data could be. And so it did a really good job of just like representing the missing data or the data that was actually there by creating pixel size. So I thought that was really nice. And the one that I've leaned towards before is alpha blending. So modifying the transparency or how much light is let through each point. Um, and I thought it was really cool because you could provide a ratio. I never knew this and I thought this was really neat. You could provide a ratio to dictate how much overlap or how many points overlap before the alpha actually increase or before the alpha actually increases. And so these examples do it in a scale of one third, one fifth, and one tenth, um, basically, but you can basically see just as long as there's more points overlapping, there will be the points will get darker. And so I thought this ratio tip was really interesting and I'm probably actually gonna apply this in some of the stuff that I do. Um, and then the last thing from here is the geom jitter. If you have some discreteness in your variable and you can allow a little bit of shifting in it, you can explore this function called geom jitter. Um, it talks about the defaults in here and it gives you fine control of how much jitter you put into it. But I've used this before in some things, especially if there's a lot of data overlap but the book just basically says, hey, go check these out. So um, I don't know how much we want to dig into this specific section, but um, I thought it was pretty straightforward. But um, if anybody wants to add anything, um, please do. Has anybody ever used these strategies before in the data that they do or that they work in? Yeah, I've used, um, I've used like alpha mostly to deal with overplotting. Um, and I did not know about the ratio thing either. I always just did it as, um, uh, like I always just would do like alpha 0 0.1 or whatever. Well, but doesn't that just come out to the same thing? It does. Like, 0.1 it is the same as one over 10. No, 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 totally. I think it's just like, I had never really, my goodness, shush. I don't know if you can, my notifications going crazy, but. I'm I'm getting uh, all of my Google Scholar alerts right now. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I had just never heard the tip that you know if you if you express it as a ratio, you basically are saying like, oh, ten points need to be overlapping for it to be solid opaque. Um, so yeah, I just thought that was like a nice way to sort of think about it when choosing values. 
Yeah. And, and Kyle was right. Like I never really thought about it. You know, it's, it's the same thing. Like one tenth over one ten is the same as point one. So you, that is correct. And I never thought about it that way. Um, so we were doing the same thing. It's just a different, I guess, but if you wanted, oh, no, you couldn't do that. Cause if you did one, yeah. So that's great. It's just a different representation. Um, love it. Uh, let's go to 2d estimation. Um, I will be honest, I will probably, for my work, I will probably never use this um, because if I shared plots like this, I don't, with the audience that I serve and the stakeholders that I have, I don't think that they would capture the information that I want to get to them, but obviously they're needed in different fields. And so we talk about them. So again, these this if we treat it as like a 2D estimation problem as the book was talking about, we can actually bin values around those areas and use color to represent like um, amount in those specific bins within our plot. And so if ggplot2 has ways to actually do this, um, has functions for us to able to do this. So uh, the first approach would be to like bin and just count things up, right? And so it provides this function called geom bin2. Same thing, but what it's doing is it's just taking within a certain area, like a square area, and it's counting all the values within it, right? And it also gives us fine grain control to say, okay, how many bins do we want? We can bin it by 10, okay? The book also talks about some research and like how to actually represent this data and some um, perception research that talks about, okay, instead of doing like boxes, it's better to do hexagons. I'm a huge fan of hexagons but it gives you the ability to modify or use hexagons to represent your data in this way. I thought this was pretty straightforward, but again, it's just another way to handle overplotting. But in my work, I probably won't use this because it's just that extra layer of explanation. But like I said, in other areas, it's definitely probably used. Um, so I guess I'm gonna open it up to the group and say, and ask the question, has anybody ever used this kind of technique to handle overplotting? I always forget, to be honest with you, so no. It's pretty rare that I need to visualize um, a scatter plot as the main thing. Like usually I, I want a scatter plot behind some boxes or behind a trend line or whatever, but it's it's pretty rare that the, the distribution of the points like is the main point that I'm trying to make. So I know this exists, but I've never used it. Here's a question. What about mapping? Like if you had a map and you had a frequency of certain things within a certain location, like a longitude and latitude, would this be something that you could do? Uh, it's definitely something that I've seen done before. Yeah. Yeah. It's but basically then, a raster. Um, yeah. But it would have to be contained within something that let's say a state or a county or your I don't know, your study square, whatever, it would have to be contained in order to make sense, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think of it like a shape file. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no I was just going to say the same thing. Can't be done with a shape file. Yeah, because something I do is counties, and counties is a shape file. If you can use a shape file and have like, it's like a heat map. It's kind of the same thing, kind of the same concept, but just using it with. I guess continuous variables right here. So it's the location. Uh, we have about three minutes. I don't. Uh, I think I could just cover really quickly cover statistical summaries. I don't know if we need to cover surfaces outside of saying. Well, I'll get to that here in a second. But statistical summaries. Um, when it comes to these, like geom histogram and geom bin two, they use familiar geoms like geom bar and geom raster. But ggplot2 has stat bin and stat bin2, which allows us to count up the number of observations in our bin, or we can provide it a function to do some type of statistical summary for us. So here's just a basic bar plot of our diamonds based on color. It gives us the count variable. But say we want the mean price for this. And this is, I think, I think this is really cool. And it, it highlights like a really cool aspect of R is that you can pass a function into like this is actually the it's a function object so mean is an object which is a function 
And you can pass that into your aesthetic to calculate a mean price based on different colors. But to do that, we have to pass stat equals summary bin, and then we bin it, and then it applies the mean calculation for that. And so a lot of cool like concepts that are happening here, the idea of being able to pass a function into another function to make a calculation is really kind of cool. So um, some other examples here, going back to that idea of a 2D density or treating this as a 2D density problem, um, we can use geombin 2D here to do that. But then if we want to pass these, change the actual representation from account to like any function or any statistical calculation we want, such as a mean, we do the same thing, geom roster, pass in stat, summary 2D, function mean, and then you get this representation. And now we're getting the mean value based on depth and table. And so a lot of really cool things happening here. Um, but that's basically it. We're just saying, hey, use the stat function or use this binning function, apply the stat function to the values that are in within that bin and then plot it with our geom. So a really cool idea, really interesting. Um, I'll open up to the group to add any further comments or questions for that. I have to hop off, but thank you, Colin, and I'll see you guys next week. Thanks, Kaya. You know, I'm good. I didn't know that you could do that. So this is super cool. I'm going to try it now. But if you want, let's go to surfaces. Because this is, um yeah, again, it's part of the black box, right? Because you don't really know what mean, what they're doing with the data. But it's kind of cool that, it, that you can put like a function there. Yeah, I think this is really cool in the fact that you can, um, yeah, I mean, this gives you, this gives you a little better sense of what's happening, right? Like you're, you're passing the specific function into it, which is nice. Um, but yeah, it comes back to that when you're doing these statistical summaries, like it's kind of like a black box. You don't really know what's happening on the back end of it. Um, so surfaces, um, I'll kind of briefly cover these real quick. It talks about, there's some extra notes here that I won't cover. We can read those on our own. But really the main kind of point from this section is, is like, hey, ggplot2 doesn't have direct support for 3D plotting, but you can still represent 3D data with a 2D image. And ways you can do that is with contours, color tiles, or bubble plots. Um, in my work, I do not do contours or color tiles, but I will say I have used bubble plots um, and they work pretty effectively um, for specific types of data. But here's how you do contours. I wasn't exactly clear on how, what this is, what level is. I know the book kind of explained it as like, it's this like, this data variable that's available in the back end of the of the ggplot2 code that you can access by calling it beyond that i really didn't understand that um i don't know if anybody else had that same feeling but that was something that i didn't understand unless i read it wrong too cuz this at this point I was um I was like ah, I'm not going to use this so I'm just going to kind of read it briefly but I don't know maybe there's a note there a little bit about like what this actual back end object is to actually plot this same thing mm -hmm. here we can use G oh go ahead go ahead no no worries um uh yeah I didn't totally understand this either it does look like from <clears throat> the code available on the book website. It looks like that notation, like the dot, dot, level, dot, dot, is deprecated. And so I think it says use after underscore stat level instead. So I, yeah, I didn't have time, but I think I would, I would look up this sort of like after stat maybe to try to figure out what is actually going on, see what the documentation says. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
here's Geom Roster. Here we're just passing to the fill aesthetic. So we're using, we're plotting three variables here, weighting, eruptions, and then density. Um, so again, plotting 3D data in a 2D dimension. And then one that I use quite a bit myself is um, bubble plots. Um, so we have some type of scatter plot here, looking at eruptions and weighting. But what we do in the geome point aesthetic is we provide a size density. Um, and then that's just going to change the size of the bubble, right? Um, it's going to make it bigger or larger based on um, the density value itself. So that's pretty much statistical summaries in a nutshell. I know I kind of covered quite a bit of ground um, today, um, but I, I took a little bit from this chapter, uh, but I'll open it up for the group for any final thoughts or final comments. What's the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Gabby. No, actually, come on, please, you go. Um, what's the context in which you use the bubble plots? So I don't know if I've, I'm just like trying to think of ways to use them. Yeah, okay, use so, them so, um, so I also teach a class in this and I teach like sports analytics stuff and where we've used bubble plots before. So um, this is going to be a really specific example. So like football, okay, let's just use American football. Say we have something like passing yards on the x rushing yards on the y and the 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 size would be wins right so what we would want to see is if you know based on if a team's running more running the ball more or passing the yard more do they win more right and so that's something that i've used it before in um i've used this in some survey results I've used. No, I shouldn't say survey results. Um, i trying to think of some other examples. We've used bubbles for survey results because that was a little bit different than just like a bar chart. Um, population data is good for this, most certainly. So like if we have two continuous variables that we're looking at, we can, you know, look at a third variable based on this. A good example would be Gapminder. I don't use that. I don't use the Gapminder data set at all, but like if you're familiar with Gapminder, um, there's a really good, or is anybody familiar with the Gapminder data set and Hans Rosling? No? I should, I should add. It's world population health data. And what he does is he does like, it's really kind of cool because he does health and wealth. So like he has like on the X axis, it's like health, Y axis is wealth. And then it's like, I think population size, I think is what he uses. But what's also really cool about that is he adds animation to it to tell the story of the health and wealth of nations over time. And that's probably one of the most popular uses of bubble charts um, is like the Hans Rosling data set with that. So I should find the video. There's a video that's really cool. Um, but those are some examples of where I've seen it used and some of the stuff that I've used them for. Um, but I, I also go, I also contend with like, if you're getting into like three, like trying to plot three dimensional stuff, it's just, it's hard for people to like get the conclusions you're trying to get across. So I think the key with bubble plots, if I'm understanding you correctly, is that you're going to want on your x well it can be x or y right but let's say on your x axis you want a discrete variable on your y axis you want well not necessarily they could all mm -hmm. they could both be continuous i suppose but you want a third variable that's gonna be numeric in a way i'm not sure if the discrete variables it could also work but essentially you're trying to visualize three variables in one so if we think about ecology, Ashley, I don't know if this is going to make any sense or not because it's in my head right now. But if you have number of hours, let's say you have 10 people looking for birds or looking for anything, right? But let's say birds. And you have the number of hours that everybody worked at the end. Like some people went and worked 10 hours looking for birds, others five hours, right? And then on the y-axis, we have the number of birds that they saw in the end. Okay, so that's great. You can do that with a scatter plot. But if we add the years of experience that each person had, then you can have 
that third variable, variable years of experience as the size of the bubble. So then you can see if, for example, someone worked a lot of hours looking for birds and saw a lot of birds, but they have a lot of experience, like let's say 10 years of experience. So then their bubble is going to be huge. But then you also have people that are really good at finding birds, but they're novices. So then they're probably worked less hours, saw a lot of birds, and the bubble is going to be very small. So then you say, ah, that person, who is that person? I want to hire that person, right? Because they have very, well, I want to hire them all, but they have less years of experience seeing a lot of birds and working for very few hours, right? So I think something like that. If you're, the, the key here, I think it's you want to see three variables at the same time. I think that's kind of like what um, the trick is here. Um, but yeah, we can think of other examples. Um, but it, it, that's what I get from, from Collins' uh, examples. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. I guess it's just like I'm not I'm not totally clear on how a bubble plot differs from doing a scatter plot with weighting. Mm, that's a good question. That's a great question. So the so the weight, so yeah, so the bubble plot would not have any any weight added to it right like you are not because when are you using weighted data when are you weighting your data i suppose that the, that's the question so you would weight your data when you don't want this variable to affect the outcome so in this case for example the one that colin presented if you don't take into account the um what is it the the number of people living in that county then you're going to have a very steep um, slope. You're going to see that that little point over there on the on the top of the left corner, it's really influencing mm. your data a lot. But is it really that influential? It's not because the population that lives there is like five people, right? So then, um, so then if you take into account that, then it's adjusting your data. It's sort of like controlling for that for that other variable that you think it's affecting your data or that it might affect the relationship between the two variables that you have, I think. Yeah, yeah. And then with the bubble, right? That, that makes I think sense. with the bubble plot. I think it's just like an issue with maybe the wording here because here, like with this, um, the population in the counties example that we have on the screen right now, they're not actually doing Waiting in this particular example. They're doing the same thing as the bubble plot where they're just having the size of the points be represented by a third variable, which is population size. <clears throat> where the weighting actually comes in is when you do your statistical summary, which is not what yeah. they're doing, even though they're calling it weight by population in that like code block. So I think you wouldn't have you wouldn't have realized that if you hadn't done the bubble plot. So I guess the yeah. bubble plot there, by doing that weight, it helped you understand yes. yeah, yeah. that third variable. So then you would do the, the, the relationship first, and then you do the model to account for that. Yeah. So I guess if you suspect that there's something that's affecting, that may affect the relationship between your models, between your variables, a bubble Plot is a way, a great way to do it, and then you go and do the weight <laughs> for your yeah. model, maybe. But I, I think I'm, I'm kind of liking this bubble idea. I'm gonna see if I can explore it a little more because I, I don't know. There's so many plots, and then you're like, which one do I use? You always go to, you know, bars or scatter plot. But I'm gonna try to start thinking about, you know, using this one more. I think outside the box. I kind of like it. You're right, Colin. There's something about bubble plots. Yeah. Yeah. I'm something, oh. something that we did, something, something that I'm thinking about. And I'm going back to, again, this is a really simplified example. Um, but with that sports example I gave you, like you could do some like splitting of this. Like it's kind of like, it's kind of like you're doing some, what is it? Um, like, uh, uh, yeah, I call it classification or clustering. Like what we would do is we would say, okay, well then plot like the mean, like put a line for the mean here, put a line for the mean here, and then it splits it up into four quadrants. And you could say like, oh, these are teams that are doing really, really well in these things. 
how many wins are they getting? Uh, Mm -hmm. People in this section here, they're not running very much, but they're passing a lot. Are they winning? You know, and so that would be something that we would do. It's really simple because the class that I teach sometimes we don't get into like modeling or anything like that. Like we'll do like K-means clustering, but that's an easy way for them to like, like make conclusions from their data using multiple like aspects of their data or calculations from their data and doing some like basic classification. So even like what you just said, yeah, you divide that thing into four quadrants. Each quadrant has like a meaning behind it because you say these are going to be like the, the best teams so these are the teams that need more help or something like that. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't ever underestimate the power of the initial, um, like exploratory analysis, graphical analysis. The thing that you're talking about that you're doing with your student, that's brilliant, and that's very difficult to do. Um, we usually just go and jump into the model. No, you have to explore your data like this. I think there's a lot of value in that, and we usually forget about it. I like it. Yeah, absolutely. Molly's the Molly's is the fun stuff, but like you can really find some really interesting stuff just by doing just some. I shouldn't say simple because it doesn't necessarily mean it's simple because there's some complex relationships that could come from just some very exploratory analysis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's all I have. Um, I appreciate everybody kind of going over. Appreciate letting me be late again. I I I promise. I'm really really trying. <laughs> really trying not to have meetings bleed over but um uh it it's happens. kind of a given no worries. it happens um i will probably for me i'm going to pause it next week so um i don't know if i'll be able to join but um if not i will be back that following week so nice. i'll be huh. here so huh. yeah actually you want to say something about about this or, or something else no, I was just selling Paul and I have fun. <laughs> I will. It's great. Um, I highly encourage anybody else to go. This is my second time going, and it's really, really great to go. Um, I need that money, and then uh, I'll go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's probably hard with other other academic conferences. This is like my one conference that I get to go to. So, But if I was in a more academic role, I would probably <laughs> prioritize those over positive for now. But... I do highly suggest it's great. It's good to see what's happening in the community. And it's, it's really cool to meet all the package developers and, um, you know, talk with them and, you know, uh, get to see them in their element. Uh, they're really interesting people and they're really, really smart. And it's really, really cool to interface with people like that. So. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to jump take off. a picture with, yeah. If you take a picture with John or with Hadley, post it in the Slack so that we, so we can see it. Yeah, I think I, I, I absolutely, I'm, I'm going to have dinner with John or hopefully catch up with John, um, which is always great. So I've already kind of contacted him and been like, hey, let's catch up. So um, I think it's going to be good. So I'll see if we can get a picture of us. So. Definitely, yeah, with all of them. With any, with, I don't know if the other guys are going, um, the, the other um, people that are on the Slack on the DSLC community, like Tan and everyone else. So if you see them, take a picture. Yeah, and we say hi. <laughs> I will absolutely prioritize that. So, all right, cool. Mm -hmm. I got to jump off. So I really appreciate everybody. See everybody in, uh, in a